Great. Good evening, everyone. Sorry to be a little bit late. Um, this is a meeting of the Northern Zoning Board of Appeals in connection with the application uh, relating to 648-652 Canton Avenue, North of Massachusetts, an application on the General Laws Chapter 40B. Um, just before we get started, I just wanted to sort of list some of the materials that I know we've received uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, we received a, a groundwater mounding analysis uh, prepared by a gentleman named Robert Rosine. Uh, it's dated January 13, 2022. It was prepared for uh, Comprehensive Land Holdings LLC and Allen and Major Associates. And so it's a groundwater mining analysis for the proposed subsurface stormwater infiltration systems uh, at the subject property. I'm sure we'll hear a bit about that tonight. Uh, we received um, a letter from Allen and Majors that's dated January 25th, uh, 2022. And it is a sewer monitoring flow analysis or summary, uh, two page letter uh, that again, I dated January 25th and that I received today. Uh, we also received from uh, Mr. Schomer an, an email with an attachment. The email was dated January 24, 2022. And this was a memorandum from MDM uh, Transportation uh, addressing uh, fire access issues. And then finally, we had received uh, an email uh, from Tim Zwinski dated January 12, 2022, which attached uh, a memo from Mr. Ned Corcoran dated January 11, 2022, and addressed, uh, primarily addressed uh, trucking estimates uh, and uh, the like uh, related to the, the development of the property, the, the trucks in and out in order to remove and to bring back in uh, fill for the site. And that was, as I said, that was an email from Mr. Corcoran uh, dated January 11, 2022. So I don't know what order everyone else wanted to do tonight. I, I guess from my perspective, I'd sort of like to hear first uh, from the gentleman who did the groundwater uh, uh, mounting analysis, because I think that's a very important issue to the, uh, to the whole subject uh, that brings us here tonight. And so without further ado, if uh, the gentleman is prepared to go, we'd be prepared to hear him. Thank you very much, Chairman Hurley. Uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Rosine uh, to come on. Oh, there he is. Good evening. Uh, and if, if it uh, please the board, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rob for his presentation. And if he can share the screen, Bev, I believe uh, Mr. Rosine has a presentation prepared. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. Uh, good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, yep. My name is uh, uh, Dr. Robert Rosine, and um, I was uh, retained uh, by, the, uh, by the applicant to conduct a uh, groundwater mounting analysis for the project um, and, uh, and, and, and spent the last uh, three weeks uh, perusing through data, uh, doing site inspections, and and uh, developing uh, um, the uh, uh, groundwater mounding um, model, um, and then uh, for the report for which you guys are uh, are now reviewing. So, um, can I just ask you a threshold question? And it may please, may yeah, betray, may betray my ignorance. But what exactly is a groundwater mounting analysis? <laughs> it's a great question. Yes, it's a, it's a great question. So, um, you know, in, in a typical project development from a stormwater perspective, we do a we do stormwater models, which are event based models. Um, you know, where we are evaluating a one year storm, a two year storm, something along those lines, uh, to evaluate uh, peak flow, volume reduction, all those other things. That's the stuff we're very very um, um, uh, familiar with. Um, a mounding analysis, the typical mounding analysis that, that we do in the state of, of Massachusetts is a, a simpler version than what we've done here, which is far more complicated, um, but is for the express purpose of evaluating the, uh, the groundwater recharge impacts um, uh, um, from, for stormwater management purposes. 
So the real things you're looking for in this is that you want to see that the uh, um, the recharge system or the infiltration system drains within a specified period of time, uh, 72 hours, and you want to see that um, you want to evaluate uh, concerns about breakout, um, which basically means that the uh, <clears throat> groundwater or, or the recharged stormwater or groundwater, depending on how you're considering it, um, is not breaking out on the slopes, causing, say, uh, bank failure, bank collapse, um, and um, what else? Um, and, and impacts to uh, um, uh, uh, water resources, so uh, wetlands and things of that sort, so that we wouldn't be um, uh, directly impacting those. Um, so that's really what, what is done here. And in this case, because um, there is not a separate, a four foot separation from the bottom of system, um, that they, they up the, uh, the level of, uh, the level of um, uh, assessment or evaluation in terms of gro groundwater modeling complexity. And, they, um, and the state requests uh, that it's done with a, with a mod flow analysis, which is a, a very sophisticated USGS three-dimensional uh, flow model. And that's what's been done here. Um, yeah, and so essentially what, we're, what we do is we evaluate kind of a worst case scenario, a hundred year storm for, for a specified amount of recharge and we, and we try and answer those questions. Let me just ask you a second question because you may help me understand this a little bit better. To the, at the very end of your analysis on page 19, you have uh, a section entitled limitations and assumptions. Yes. You're familiar with that. Can you, can you explain to me what, what all that means and what the significance of those limitations and assumptions are? All right. We're going to jump right into the meat of it. I love it. Um, well, uh, I, okay. <laughs> so I'm going <clears> to <throat> hit it at a high level. The first level is uh, what kind of engineer would I be if I didn't have limitations and assumptions, right? That's right. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, um, a result of, uh, of uh, professional uh, 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 engineering insurance. So uh, what this is, is essentially what it is. It, it, I'm telling um, the statement of limitations and assumptions in, in a nutshell is that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Um, and that models are only as accurate as the uh, information that you have at the time, and that they may or may not be, um, or actually they're not very likely, uh, um, uh, 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 exact um, representations of reality. Rather, what they are is um, uh, useful tools for, uh, for planning and design. So, um, and that's essentially what it is. And, and um, I think the one additional piece that's added in that limitation and assumption piece is, is the recognition of the additional uh, difficulty of groundwater modeling. Uh, ground subsurface characterization is, is one of the most difficult things we do um, from an engineering perspective, well, maybe not the most, but from a, a water resources um, perspective, groundwater characterization is very, very difficult. Um, Surface water, you know, streams, rivers, ponds, uh, flooding is 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 far easier to deal with. Um, uh, subsurface characterization is a little bit uh, like the idea of a. Um, sorry, sorry, my dog. I love the wonders of working from home. Um, the um, uh, so where was I going with that? The um, It's a little bit like the idea of a um, of trying to characterize uh, um, an elephant in a, in, in a dark room, right? Every, you're poking at different places, and you really don't know what that that looks like. You have you have a certain degree of, of confidence, but there's there's a fair amount that we do not know. Um, so that's uh, I think what you see in there in the limitations and assumption is it would be consistent with it, what you would expect to see. I would think in any uh, groundwater study report, uh, which is basically, um, you know, uh, recognizing that it's not entirely accurate, but it is still quite useful. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I sure. interrupted you. Please, please continue. No, that's great. Uh, I appreciate all the con contextual pieces because yeah, it, it, that last piece, limitations and assumption, is is really a, a very important point. And we can almost go straight to the calibration aspect of it and say that you know the residuals, the calibration. Uh, that was done for this basically shows uh, about a, uh, just under a 5% error, which for, um, for 
um, groundwater modeling is actually really good. And to give you an, a, a comparison, an example, the, uh, the, um, the, the surface water modeling, the hydrocad that's done for the 100 year storm, that's not what I did. That's, that's what you guys review as, as a matter of routine, you know, to make sure that the, the two year and the 10 year and the 100 year and et cetera are all um, managed appropriately. Those type of models are not even calibrated, right? They're not even calibrated. Um, and, uh, and the typical groundwater mounding study is not calibrated either, um, but, the, but, a, but a mod flow because, because uh, model, because you're getting to this additional level of complexity is. So um, with that, I think what I'll do is um, I'm going to see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. And okay. I'll just do a, a, a quick um, presentation. It, it's, it's really just high level pieces. I promise not to put everybody to sleep. Um, Spend as much time as you like. This is an important issue, I think, to everybody uh, in the neighborhood. So I think you know, the okay. more information you can give us, the better better off we'll be. Okay, thank you. Do you have a sense for how much time you do or do not want me to take? I th I've only got 10 slides thereabouts. Is 20 minutes okay? Sure, that's fine. Okay, okay, let's do that. Okay. So um, groundwater mount mounting analysis. So um, you know what what was done here. Um, I think we, we spoke about this a little bit already, but uh, developed a three dimensional uh, mo model using mo uh, ModFlow, which is a, a complicated, um, a sophisticated USGS US Geological Survey model. Um, and then then in fact we're not actually running ModFlow. We're running ModFlow, but we're running it on another another software. There's then vendors that sell software platforms. So I used a software called Groundwater Vista. And, um, and what this model does is it enables me to, do, to determine the, really these three characteristics here, which are now then allow me to answer the questions that I need to uh, for the state requirements. So first one is I'm able to evaluate the water surface elevation for the estimated seasonal high groundwater. Um, I'm then able to uh, evaluate the water surface elevation during a 100 year storm event with the subsurface infiltration and recharge. And, uh, and then I'm able to uh, uh, evaluate the water surface elevation of the period of time following the storm. And what that enables me to do is um, to evaluate the impacts of groundwater recharge, um, to assess if the infiltration basin storage is empty within 72 hours, and the impacts of groundwater mounding on surrounding areas and water resources for breakout. So what do these things mean? Infiltration basin storage, that is, this, that is the, the, the space below ground that will be occupied by the stormwater. Um, it is, and then the impacts of groundwater mounding on water resources for breakout. What that is, is to make sure that the groundwater is not gonna be seeping out of the banks or flooding, um, flooding downstream wetlands or otherwise. I mean, of course it's gonna go to the wetland, but that it's not altering the water surface in the ground, in the wetlands. And what I'd like to, what I, what I want to do to put this in context here is, um, is uh, in theory, one would not an, expect an increase in groundwater ve elevations at the site scale because the total amount of recharge pre and post development should be balanced. So what does that sentence mean? So groundwater elevations, that's how, how much the water's coming up. Um, site scale is the whole site, you know, the whole 10 acre site approximately. Um, and then recharge is the amount of water that's going back in pre and post is before and after conditions. So in theory, if, if you're doing a good job at your stormwater management, you're, you're kind of balancing um, the, um, uh, the volumes. So in theory, if the volumes are relatively close, uh, you wouldn't expect to see um, uh, a real increase in groundwater elevations um, if, if everything's going, uh, uh, working as it should. And, and that is in fact the intention of the mass stormwater standard number three, which is to ensure a water balance where pre and post groundwater recharge is approximately balanced. Um, and so what you would expect is a, uh, a mounding under the infiltration systems uh, that would essentially be uh, um, uh, temporary and it would diminish both in time and distance. So um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions before I go on. Okay, so um, uh, what I'll do next is I'm just gonna describe the, uh, the summary findings and then we'll go into the details. So not, not make you wait for the, um, 
uh, uh, for, for the for the results. So um, the, the the important thing to understand here is that the uh, what what the, what the study has identified is that the infiltration systems all drain completely within 72 hours. Um, the peak of the hydraulic mounding beneath the four infiltration systems diminishes completely with 72 hours. Um, why that's important is if it does not, the systems really can't drain. And, um, and, and uh, an, an example of that would be if you're in an area with high groundwater, um, that it might not be able to diminish. But um, in a very, very, very simple sense, um, it would have you almost it basically has to in this conditions because um, uh, the proposed project brings in a substantial amount of fill. The majority of the site only has approximately I think it was 22 to 27 inches of separation from the existing ground surface and the groundwater table. So uh, what I could tell you without even doing the mounting analysis is that we would not meet that criteria number two without the additional fill, but because the fill in some places as much as a seven feet. Um, um, we're, you know, just because we're bringing the site up, uh, uh, we wouldn't, uh, um, uh, we, we, you, can, you can pretty much expect that the groundwater, the hydraulic mounting will diminish. Um, so groundwater mounting rises to uh, um, or at uh, uh, near the bottom of the infiltration system, which means that the, the fill amount is the appropriate amount and then begins to decrease, de decrease soon after the storm event ceases. Um, there's no breakout or impact on surface water resources or wetlands was observed from rising groundwater. And uh, this is not really a question of, 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 of the, um, of the uh, say it Rob, um, uh, not a question of, of uh, the mass stormwater standards, but um, more uh, a local, local question really for you guys as much as anybody, which is the mounting effects uh, with, the, with respect to the, uh, the abutters at 640, 656, and 654. Um, they're really minimal. Um, when, you, when you say mounting effects, what do you mean? Um, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, uh, I, um, not to be evasive here, but just hold that question because I'll, I'll, I'll show you exactly. It'll be really clear in it when I show you a couple of things. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, so what we have here, this is a site overview map. Um, uh, Canton Avenue to orient everybody. Uh, Holmes Lane. Um, uh, Mergewood uh, Drive here, and and then the the, uh, the subject parcel, um, approximately seven seven and a half acres, seven point something like that. So the modeled area for this it was essentially uh, about double that. It was it was almost fourteen acres that was modeled. And uh, uh, for reference, your system four, uh, sorry, uh, system one is here. The infiltration system one, infiltration system two is here, kind of on the top of the hill. Uh, infiltration system here uh, three is as we're beginning to work our way down and uh, infiltration system four is, is at our lowest elevation. And for reference, you can kind of see existing house is right here, right? So that shows us all where the, uh, you know, kind of a reference point. And then here's, here's a bunch of the uh, large uh, mature trees. I, I think the, this is the the elm, or the, uh, and then some of these other ones. I can't remember what these ones were, but that that will be preserved um, in this area. Um, I'm not going to go into the stormwater system. I, I suppose I can if if you need if uh, if if you'd like me to describe it. But I would actually probably de defer to Phil uh, Cordero for that one. I, I did not design the stormwater system. I'm aware of what's going on with it, but um, uh, details of it I would I would I would defer to Phil. Um, and then, then here is our intermittent stream along here. So we have Mergewood Drive. I believe it's an 18-inch culvert under the road. And then we have, um, I think this is, this is, uh, what is it, 656? I always remember, the, forget the numbers. Yeah, six. I think this is 656. Um, and there's a, a, a culvert. I believe it's an 18-inch culvert again uh, that flows under uh, the driveway. Um, so this is, this is basically and very likely just in a, an old an old stream channel here, uh, and then and then our uh, our drain uh, to the existing storm drains under Canton Avenue. Okay, so your question about mounding groundwater mounding. So that's what this is. So what I'm plotting here is a system one, two, three, and four. Um, uh, each of these figures is shown the same same general way. Red, uh, orange is your ground surface. Uh, gray 
is your uh, system bottom. Uh, yellow is the estimated seasonal high water. Um, and then blue is the, water, the, the modeled water surface elevation. Okay, and then the red box is that 72 hour period after the, um, um, after the, after the storm ceases. Um, so w before I get into the details of what elevations there are, the, way, the main way you're gonna read this is, here's our, our starting at water surface elevation. It rises with the storm. Um, it then, in this case, it almost intersects with the, the system bottom. Um, and, uh, um, and then just the, the storm ceases, uh, and, then it, and then that 72 hour period begins. Then you can see it's returning to its original, uh, the, uh, the, the pre-storm elevation um, indicating that, that um, uh, because groundwater mounding is, 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 has, is, um, is, 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 is lowering, um, uh, you can expect that, these, that the, uh, the, the system uh, itself will be empty within 72 hours. If you saw uh, this groundwater mound into the system during that 72 hours, um, uh, even though our, our, dr our drainage, our drain, our residence time, our drain time calculations might show that it empties in 72 hours, it would not because it couldn't. The groundwater table extends into that system uh, during that period of time uh, or for that entire period of time. It's not uncommon uh, uh, for a point of reference to see a groundwater mound enter. Um, and, um, uh, but but uh, what, you, what you would expect to see is that it's going to drain adequately um, uh, uh, for, for the system hydraulics to, uh, to work. Um, so what we have, system one, this is the one furthest down the hill. I'm sorry, no, system one is the one on the top of the hill. System one and two are on the top of the hill. Um, and uh, uh, so you can see both, in both these cases, they, they both drain fully within 72, or, or the mounding is, 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 uh, is, has passed within 72 hours. In this case, system two, this is the largest of the system. This is a very, very large system. Um, it, the groundwater mounding does come up into the system uh, for, for a brief period of time, um, but, it is, but it does drain uh, by, by the end of that 72 hour period. Um, and then the same thing, system three and um, comes up slightly within it. Um, and then system four uh, does not. And uh, so, so what this is basically identifying is, is that we have, uh, the system is functioning, at, it should be functioning a, as intended. So any, any questions on that? Yeah, Robert, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, I'm Sean Reardon. I'm the, the, the ZBA's review consultant um, with Tetra Tech. Sure. Can you explain how your blue line starts and ends below the estimated seasonal high groundwater? Yeah, yeah. So what this is, is it's just, it's the accuracy of the, of the model uh, with respect to uh, the seasonal high water table. So uh, you can see in some places that it, like, uh, where are we at here? Uh, system two and system three, um, the seasonal high is, is quite close um, to the modeled. Uh, and in system one, it's not really. And system four, it's not really. This is, this is not uh, too uncommon. As I said, the, the, um, in the calibration, we were less than 5% off in terms of our, our, um, our accuracy. Was, I think it was 4.7% was, um, uh, was, was, was the residual mean error uh, is the term for it. Um, so calibration statistics are actually really are, are pretty good, um, but the way that you would get these the, um, a model um, you know more accurate is just more data, more monitoring. Um, you know where there it's we're using um, uh, uh, methods that are um, are okay for groundwater, but not great. We're using um, uh, soil staining, for example, and and to really get a, a, gro uh, um, a groundwater model accurate. Um, um, you know, a calibrated groundwater model, which is which is not what's required here. Um, but if you know, if we if we were spending a hundred thousand dollars in a multi-year study, what we would have is you know groundwater wells, monitoring wells throughout the site um, that we would then calibrate to. Yeah. So, so is what is what you're saying is that those are independent characteristics. In other words, that the estimated seasonal high groundwater table does not is not part of your model. It's just a separate reference line. That's correct. Okay, thanks. 
That's that's exactly right. So you have an estimated seasonal high water, um, and you use those as targets uh, for your calibration statistics. But you're actually generating a water surface elevation through the model. So the, the model itself is actually run for over a, a, a year's time. Um, so you have a, a year calibrate or a year generation period. That initial year, uh, which represents the first part of it. That's why it actually starts at 8760. Um, yeah, because you've gone through a full year's worth of hours. Um, I think it's hours, yeah, hours, full year's worth of hours. Um, and then you have, uh, there, so the, the, it, it's, it's not entirely linear, um, the way, the way that, it's just the way that the model's built, but you, because you have what's referred to as, as stress periods and you have, you have initial, initial stress period, which represents the pre-year, you have a, a secondary stress period, which represents your 100-year storm which is really just a 24, 48 hour period. And then you have a um, uh, your third stress period, which is your uh, a 10 day follow um, uh, after the storm where that 72 hour mark is evaluated. Okay. Any, any, other, uh, any other questions on that? So this uh, this is an example of um, so, the, uh, uh, so th this is what we have here is um, um, uh, seasonal which sorry um, uh, plan view comparisons of um, groundwater baseline versus the peak elevations um, uh, at, at for the, both the estimated seasonal high and our forty eight hour um, so this this is for example this is uh, system one, and this is this is uh, part of system two. Uh, system two is actually much larger than this, but just to try and keep them on the same scale. Um, so you can see here at, um, <clears throat> at our at our standard time, you'd expect the 119 co groundwater contour to come kind of right through the edge of our uh, of system one, and then uh, you can see the groundwater surface comes up substantially, and we you know we're at about a, a, about an elevation 121. Now at the edge, so it comes up almost two feet, um, which is what you see here. So um, system one, the maximum water surface elevation increase, it comes up by about 2.7 feet. Uh, and this is what you see for, for all the various uh, systems. And um, so, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's just demonstrating and showing uh, what, 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 I've, what I showed you in the, in the other figures as, uh, uh, prior. So then the next thing that we did was uh, evaluate uh, impacts uh, kind of at the uh, site perimeter, um, you know, neighbors, uh, 640 Canton, 654 and 656. And uh, you can see there's they're very, very minor impacts. And um, we have uh, a 0.7 foot uh, impact at 640 Canton. We have 0 0.6 at, uh, at 654 Canton and we have another 0.6 at 656 Canton. And one of the things I wanna point out that is not done in this model, and it, because it's, it's generally not a requirement of it, but with one of the things to understand how these models work, this is very different than our HydroCAD model. We're evaluating like a pre and post um, 100 year storm. I don't have a pre 100 year storm that I'm evaluating here. So the reason I'm telling you that, I just have a 100-year storm for this recharge condition. And uh, the reason I tell you that is because um, you would expect the groundwater surface to come up with every storm that occurs, every storm. And, um, um, and, uh, uh, and that's not uncommon. Um, as an example, I, I think in the, uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the report, I referenced um, a USGS study uh, that... Um, that talks about the, 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 the standard variation that we see in seasonal high water, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a till or in a sand and gravel in a, in a valley might, um, uh, might, might vary as much as four or five feet. In, in other places for a till, it might vary as much as 16 feet annually. And essentially what that is, is if you imagine um, that the easiest way to imagine how that works is imagine um, I'm gonna you're gonna take a certain volume of water, right? Let's take a gallon of water. If I pour a gallon of water in a very large pipe, 
I call it maybe a 12 inch diameter pipe, it, it's, it's gonna barely come up at all when I pour that gallon in. If I pour that same gallon in, in a one inch pipe, it's probably gonna come up, you know, two feet or more. Um, and, and what that is, is the different pipe size is essentially the same thing as the different porosity of your different materials. So we're in glacial tills here, you would expect a tremendous amount of seasonal variation in glacial tills. So uh, you, you would expect high seasonal high waters and you would also expect uh, a large variation uh, with res respect to just uh, to big storms. Okay. And then this is, this is the, essentially these are the same figures just at the site scale. Uh, what you see on the, on the lower portion is the plan view. And then the upper portion is the, uh, is the cross section. And what you can see, this is, this is uh, kind of our baseline condition. Um, and then you can see how much the water, so I'll just toggle back and forth. You'll see, you can, if you look in on the top, you can see how much the water surface comes up. So I'm just toggling back and forth for you. Um, you can see the water surface is coming up two to three feet. Uh, during that period of time for that hundred year storm, which as I said, is, is really, is gonna be expected. And then- and, and then, Dr. Um, Rosie, the, can I just ask a question or through the chair? Um, this please. is Joe Samposi. That two, where, you, where you referenced the water going up two to three feet, that's directly underneath the stormwater systems, correct? Or that's exactly that right. That's exactly right. That's gonna be just underneath the infiltration systems. And, um, and, and it diminishes uh, pretty rapidly as as we uh, as we get to the edges, and and that and that's what was evaluated under this analysis, right? So this analysis showed that uh, by the time we're at essentially at the at the perimeter of the property, um, there's 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 very little impact at all. Yeah, that's exactly right. So and then what we get to here, this is the 72-hour mark, and you can see it's fully relaxed. It's back down to the original conditions. And, uh, and then this is just our groundwater flow paths. Okay. So um, that's probably a good place to, uh, I think we talked about this, the 4.7% residuals. That's probably a good place to, uh, to stop and answer any other questions you might have. Yeah, I just want to ask you one, and maybe this should be self-evident, but maybe I'm just being obtuse, but are you saying that Stop, let me go back. You recognize that people in the neighborhood, particularly on the Merlewood side, have experienced issues with uh, high groundwater uh, at yes. various points of time in the year. Right. I mean, you, you understand that that's the case. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I have I have groundwater problem. I live in Milton, obviously I have groundwater problems in my backyard. So I, I know this, times of the year when I'm gonna see a bit of flooding in my backyard. Um, and so the folks that around the perimeter of this property experience the same kinds of things. So my question for you is, are you saying that this development in, the, in this system, this infiltration system uh, will not exacerbate those problems for surrounding properties at any point in time throughout the year? That, that is what I'm saying, yeah. Um, so, because here, here's here's what I um, th that is that is exactly what I'm saying. So um, there's there's really two primary factors on this one. So um, um, yeah, groundwater. This would not probably well the systems wouldn't drain within 72 hours. Uh, whether or not we would have impacts on neighbors is a different. Uh, I don't think that would be any different. But uh, the fact that they wouldn't drain within 72 hours uh, would not it would not occur without all the fill. So uh, fill is, is a necessary component. Uh, you bring the ground surface up. So now you're, you're creating a separation from seasonal high. And in fact, what you're actually doing is creating more storage on the site. And that's not actually even factored in in the model. Um, you know, we could do that. This model only models uh, two layers, uh, um, a bedrock layer and uh, you know, approximately a 10, 12 foot layer of till um, over the site. In fact, what there is is there's a, um, bedrock, a layer of till, and then a layer of fill over that. The layer of fill even has greater storage capacity because presumably it'll be a, a sand and gravel that'll have good load bearing capacity. Um, so that is not evaluated here. Um, so, um, you know, the, the issue about 
uh, abutters and impacts is, is if I, I kind of go back to the earlier statement that I made uh, about this, which is, um, you know, in theory, you would not expect an increase in groundwater elevation um, unless there's a substantial amount of additional water added. And, um, and uh, um, you know, when I say substantial, I mean substantial. I don't mean, um, you know, we're uh, like, um, I don't mean, in this case we have, we're, we're recharging more than is required, um, but that, I, I, that's not a substantial amount. Uh, a, a great example of that not being a substantial amount is the very fact that uh, um, the mass stormwater criteria is for a fairly small amount of recharge. I think it's 3,000 cubic feet. Um, and the uh, uh, and the EPA standard is or, uh, is for one inch of impervious um, uh, w one inch of runoff from impervious cover uh, is more like I think it's thirteen or fourteen thousand I can't remember um, and we we and we uh, are recharging about double that um, uh, but uh, that that in my mind is not is not a substantial amount because what you what you need to think about is is we're in a um, we are in a um, in an, basically in a, in a suburban ecosystem where there's a lot of pavement and a lot of rooftops that have already disrupted this um, uh, the groundwater recharge that's occurring. Um, so what it's really doing is it's just sort of balancing all this stuff out, which is the whole goal of these technologies, which is the more recharge you get, the better. Um, and uh, not not that there's no limits to that, but we would we would see those types of limits. Uh, in this type of analysis. If we were recharging too much water, we would expect to see that in, in breakthrough or that the, that the, um, that the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the groundwater table wasn't um, relaxing fast enough. And, and I'll give you an example. Like there are places where um, uh, in, in, West, in Western Mass, I was doing a, um, a project similar to this. And we were trying to recharge a hundred year storm because we were in a gravel pit and it was a water supply. Um, so why not? Um, and um, but you still do an analysis to look at at the impact. Um, but we were recharging a whole hundred year storm. Uh, so so Mr. Hurley, um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, if you have any kind of follow ups, or if I just rambled too much. No, no, no. I think you I think you answered the question. Um, does anyone else have questions for? I do, Dr. Rosine. Can you can you go back to um, table thirteen? Yeah. Can you table thirteen? Oh, figure thirteen? No, which which yes. table? Yes, I'm sorry, figure thirteen. I don't even know where figure thirteen is. Which one is figure thirteen? Oh, there we go. Sorry, yes, yes, yes. There we go. Can you, can um, you explain to me in in layman's terms what this is? Yeah, I, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't. Um, so what, what this is, um, is, so each one of these figures is evaluating the exact same thing. And it's for each of the three properties, um, uh, 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 kind of essentially the, uh, I, I get my north and south mixed up here, but 640 Canton, uh, I think it's to the east. Is that right? It's to the east. Um, and then 654 and 656 are both to the south. You guys know where they are. I don't need to describe it to you. Sorry. Um, the um, uh, the, the uh, vertical axis is is your ground surface elevation, so it's going to change for each location. Um, and then what we have across the bottom is hours. You can kind of ignore that um, um, because th those hours aren't going to make a lot of sense to you. Because I told you we, we model it for a full year. And then there's these different time periods, but the important part to pay attention to is the red box that represents your essentially your 72 hour period and the time right before it just during the storm. So the red, the orange line is your groundwater, or sorry, is your ground surface. So that is where your feet would be. It's where the car is parked. It's where the, where the, uh, you know, the, 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 the front door is. Um, and, um, and and then you have your uh, your blue line, which is your water surface elevation. And what that is is that that is uh, the water surface elevation before the storm. Uh, then during the period of recharge, uh, it comes up. In this case, uh, 0.74 feet. Uh, and then uh, by that 72-hour mark, it's um, it's 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 back down. Now we don't we're not worried about that same relaxation period, but I still put that figure or the 72-hour mark in just for a point of reference. 
Um, hey, can I, can I, if you don't mind, can I just stop you there? So yeah, when, please. You're, you're talking about the the property line at 640 Canton Ave. Where on that property line is this, or am I just missing the whole point here? Yeah, um, it is. Let's go back to that. Actually, let's do it off of this one. It's a little hard to tell. Here's the house, 640 Canton Avenue. I'm sorry, I realize you can't can't tell. Um, here is, I believe the property line is right here. Do you see my cursor? I do, yes. Yeah, and then here's, here's the well. So the well in this case is put, it's not a true well, but for the purposes of the model, it's, 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 a, it's an observation well. Um, it's put right on the property line. So by the time you get to the house, you'd expect it to be even less. In this case, for 656 Canton, I put it because uh, I don't know why I put it here, but I put it right, right on the edge of the of the building foundation. And then in this case for 654, I put it right on the edge of uh, of, of Mergewood Drive. So it's still a little a little beyond 654 um, because the model. Oh, that's why the model. We don't have topography that extends that far. So. Um, what was the uh, rationale for putting the wells where you did? Um, I think the rationale was to uh, evaluate, uh, to get to get a good, to, to uh, assess and evaluate the impacts uh, to, to the abutter, butting properties. That's why it was done that way. Was there any consideration taken in your analysis um, uh, regarding where various butters might be experiencing flooding already, um, you know, what I would call problem areas? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, it, it, remember, this is a groundwater model, um, uh, not, not a, a surface water model. I fully recognize that there's, that when I, when I look at this, the, this area, that there's probably drainage issues in here. Um, and, um, but, but I, I absolutely stand by uh, what, what I had said prior, which was um, a well-managed site that's infiltrating properly um, uh, where you have a good water balance um, uh, should not uh, create any more uh, or exacerbate those issues. Um, you know, let, let, let's talk 656 Canton for a moment, right? This looks to me like it's, it's a house built over an old stream, um, you know. It's, uh, so, you know, the drainage issues around here, I am sure there are. We have high water groundwater tables. We, we, we appear to be in a, in a drainage area here. Um, but so uh, yeah. here's, what, here's what I don't understand is if you go back to figure 13 and, you know, I, and I, I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? So sure, please, yeah. It's, no, figure sorry. 13 shows that the um, groundwater during an event is going to increase by between six and nine inches, depending on which one of these properties we're talking about. But right. Six, or, six to nine inches isn't that like significant if we're in an area that already has issues? No. Here's what I want to show you. Not not even remotely. Um, So this is this is um, th this section here is uh, is um, is is quoted more more or less verbatim out of a a, a, lo a local USGS study of this area. Um, okay, so this this one evaluated I can't remember is eighty some wells they monitored them for uh, an, a, an extended period of time and what they see is the variations in seasonal high uh, would be less than or equal to four feet for sand and gravels nine point two feet in sand and gravel on terraces so that's uh, oh, sorry, in valleys on terraces would be above and up to 16 feet in till um, at a 90% confidence interval. Um, so uh, the answer is, is six inches a big deal on this? Absolutely not. Um, and uh, and what, 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 uh, and so the, the uh, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm trying to be uh, disrespectful here, um, uh, but what, it, what my point is just that it's, it's, it's really inconsequential when you look at the overall variations and what, you would, what we also don't see here, what, what, what isn't studied and what, this isn't a requirement of, of, Ma of MassDEP um, 
<clears throat> but uh, is wh why not? What, you can evaluate a normal hundred year storm and, and see how much um, uh, mounding occurs, right? So a hundred year storm in a pre-development condition, you, you expect always the groundwater to come up uh, when, when there's a storm. And if, if, um, if, 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 uh, if the site, um, if the overall site hydrology has not changed substantially, you wouldn't expect um, the, uh, the, uh, the flooding or the, uh, um, or the impacts from groundwater to change. Uh, wh where you would expect it would be um, really in the, in the converse. So, you know, it, with all due respect, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing here. We're, we're doing recharge, right? This is, oh, why did I just do that? Um, we, this, is, this is good stormwater management, right? This is, um, um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is cutting edge stuff, not cutting edge, but it's, this is state of the art um, where we're taking um, subsurface infiltration systems, uh, you're trying to mimic pre-development hydrology. So if you think about what the site looked like before, you have trees and grass and all this other stuff, uh, and some houses and some some um, um, tennis courts and things like that. Um, uh, but and the wa and water is getting into the ground in varying degrees. But because this the new site will have so much pavement and so many buildings, to replicate that, we are now putting it underground. And, um, uh, and and making sure that we maintain the sponge factor for the uh, uh, for for the site for the project, and that that's that's really what this is about. And this is, you know, I, I recognize there's a butter concerns, but fr from a regulator regulator standpoint, this is exactly what the regulators are looking for. Exactly, so I, I understand that, and you've mentioned very the um, DEP standards and, and all these other standards, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But what I want to know is what is the impact on the abutters? And I'm talking about the abutters immediately abutting. I'm talking about downhill um, near the brook, just a few hundred yards away. Um, are you able to say with certainty that there's going to be no negative impact uh, from this development on, on those neighbors? No, and I, I would never say that. Um, that, that but I, what I am saying is that there's a, there's a very minor impact that should be um, uh, no different than a standard storm, um, and uh, um, that you that the these these places experienced flooding all the time. I would guess not all the time. I would imagine that th that's that's an exaggeration. Let me let me back that one. Um, I would imagine that there are places around here that deal with flooding due to the high seasonal groundwater, and um, and in 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 my estimation, the uh, the amount of fill and storage that's being added to the site. Um, uh, uh, we'll deal with that more than adequately, because um, remember what we're they're bringing in close to seven feet of fill. That's like you've taken a sponge that's, you know, you've taken your sponge and now you've doubled the size of it. And so, um, uh, uh, so from that standpoint, um, it, it it should work. It, it should work quite well. And and to answer your question, Mr. Brown, I think the only way to answer your question definitively would be to for to have for for neighbors to have. Uh, um, you know, uh, groundwater um, monitoring wells that that um, you know you can you can establish uh, a model with that degree of confidence, and and that is the type of model that's built for sites like um, you know Superfund sites and things like that. But for a um, for a, a, a typical development model, this is this is a, a sophisticated model. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see something, um, you, you know, that are even higher, higher levels of sophistication. If there's uh, contaminants um, uh, nearby that you're concerned about the, the, um, the groundwater mound entering the, um, uh, the contaminants. But um, for, for this, for this level of detail, this is, this is pretty standard. So I, I realize that that's going to be um, not a, um, a um, satisfying answer for you. Uh, but it is the answer I've got for you. That's totally fine. I, I'm just I'm just trying to learn this as we're going through it. And so I have one more question, and, and yeah, then I'll sure. let somebody else have a chance. No, it's when, good. When, when you said that, when you answered my last question by saying that there would be no additional impact that's um, different than what you would have in a typical storm, is that is that what you said? That is that is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So so what does that mean? So. What would the impact? Are you talking about the impact on the on the neighbors 
during a storm or otherwise? Dur I'm talking about the, uh, um, the impact, what, what in a pre-existing condition, um, uh, neighbors and all, everybody would expect to see groundwater tables rise in, in a, in, during a storm event. Um, regardless it, it, of, of this, of this, and, and that, that's what I'm saying is that the same okay. rise that I'm showing you here, you would expect something very similar to that in a, in a normal storm. That's, that's what I was getting at. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I have a I question. Have a, I have a quick, oh, Sean, is that you? It, it is. Okay. Go ahead. You go first. So Rob, if I could, if I could ask you, why, why didn't you model the pre-existing condition? I mean, if I could just stay, if I was a neighbor and I had a, let's say a, a, a windowsill in my basement that the groundwater table came to within three inches of, and you're telling me that it's going to go up six inches. And now that groundwater table is going to over that windowsill. Yeah, that's, that's a significant change for me. But if what you're saying is that under current conditions, you would expect the groundwater to come up the same 0.74 feet. I guess I, I would have liked to have seen that to demonstrate that there is no net change as a result of your project. Whereas saying the groundwater table is going up 0.74 feet, you know, depending on where it is and what it is, I mean, these all people have basements and these elevations are all in the zone of their basement because of we're talking five feet below finished grade. Yeah, there has to be some way to to reconcile your graphic here that shows a rise as a result of the project against some current condition that's similar or worse? I guess the simple answer is that that's not what is uh, required of, uh, of, of, uh, of but by the mass stormwater standards. And uh, so- it, it, The, you're, the you're, mass stormwater standards aren't the audience here, the neighbors are. So this is, right. you know, demonstration of the standard is one thing, this is, this is this is analysis specific to the neighbor, so we, we can't so, sort of conflate the regulations with specific applications. This is this is solely for the express purposes of determining what kind of impacts the project will have on the neighborhood, regardless of the stormwater standards. Yeah. So that, that's I guess that my simple answer to that is that's not what I understood the mounting analysis for. I, I thought the mounting analysis was a. Uh, was a requirement of the, the stormwater standards when you when you're less than the four foot separation. So uh, if if I if I was um, developing a model specifically for the neighbors, um, yeah, then then possibly we would have done it that way. But that's you know when I do stormwater mounding analyses, this is this is this is this is what's typical. Um, and uh, um, so I, I guess that's that that's the difference there. How hard would it be to model the current conditions? So instead of recharging along the bottom of the system, you're recharging over a longer area of so natural grass and things like that. Is 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 that doable with the information that you have right now? It is, yeah. It is definitely doable, yeah. And, and what you're saying is you, you, you'd expect to see the same 0.74 feet or, or reasonably close the same 0.56 under current conditions as you would under proposed conditions? Actually, I'll tell you what, what I would. So one of the funny things about models, a lot of times uh, they're, they're very hard to build, but the, but the, the results are very simple to um, kind of guess. I would guess that it's going to come up a lot more. So, so that would, to, to me, that would be a, a really valuable thing for me to see. So I can with confidence tell the neighbors that the net result of this project is, is, a, is, a, is a negative change in the groundwater table during the same event. Because with, without that, all I'm seeing is a is a is a graphic that says, when it when it rains, the groundwater table on your property is coming up. Well, yeah, it makes sense that we would expect that, but this says it's coming up 0.74 feet at my foundation. I'm speaking on behalf of the neighbors here, as a result of your project. That that's that's well, not an image that makes me comfortable. Well, so so it, it, I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I interpreted that a little differently. I saw I saw this as okay. I've got a ground surface at at 111, and I've got a uh, water surface at 105. So um, yeah, you know, or I mean, you don't. You almost have to uh, 
ask folks how many how many folks in the area have uh, sump pumps in their basement, right? If they if they if these places have sump pumps, that tells you that they're that the uh, water table um, uh, likely comes up um, within into their basement um, um, as a matter of routine. And as such, sump pump. To me, what I saw here was this is this is still well below ground surface, and um, um, you know it's it's six feet here, it's three feet here and it's five feet here. Uh, so uh, where, where I would have been concerned is what, um, the, the, again, if we, if we were looking at the mass stormwater standard, the mass stormwater standard is, is not, does the, the groundwater table come up? It's, is there, is there breakout? Do you see water coming out at the ground surface? And, um, and, and that's, you know, we're, we're, we're light years from that here. I understand that, but put yourself in a, in a in a bit different perspective. So, so let's say you're the the resident at 640 Canton Avenue, and your basement finished floor is carpeted, and you've got it all finished, and it looks nice, and you've got sheetrock on the walls. And my basement is at 105.5. All right, now the project comes along. That 100 year storm comes. That water surface goes up nine inches. Now that water is you know, it's maybe an inch deep, but it's an inch deep above my finished floor and in my carpet and in my sheetrock. So I think we need to demonstrate that the net result of the project is not going to exacerbate a condition that could cause a negative effect on the, the neighbors. So, so I, I think we can do that without that. Here's, let me show you how. So as an example, a typical basement is going to be um, uh, eight feet, seven feet thereabouts. Uh, to the, so that the bottom of the foundation is, is going to be about 10 feet. Um, so if this is the ground surface, this, this, this box here represents 10 feet. Uh, let me actually get rid of the, um, the uh, fill here. No fill, and we're gonna do blue, right? So if you look at this, if this is your foundation, right? And um, this, this tells you that in every instance here, so that's 10 feet. Let's do the same 10 here. Well, actually, let's just start with this, just, just for this discussion purposes. This is your foundation. This tells you that, yeah, this house has a sump pump. Are they going to be using it before? Yep. Are they going to be using it after? Yep. Um, same thing. Again, you're, you're, sorry to interrupt, Rob, but you're missing the point. All right. I'm not. Let's, yeah, yeah, because it's, it's, you're, you're, you're showing a rise in groundwater surface, right? So, so if I have a Renoir on the wall of my basement, you know, in the basement used to flood to the bottom of the Renoir and now it floods to the middle of the Renoir, that's a problem. So, so what we need to demonstrate is that the rise that I'm seeing here on your graphic is not solely a function of the property, the changes of the property. If you can demonstrate that this same rise would occur under pre-development conditions, then I think there's not a problem. But if you're saying that the project is gonna result in a nine inch rise of the groundwater table at an abutting property, that's an issue from my, my perspective, because I don't know what negative changes that could cause. All I know is that's that's higher higher water at my property, at my foundation, than I used to experience before the project. So, so try not to sort of sort of reconcile why it's not a problem. Reconcile that it's it's a net change in the wrong direction that needs to be addressed in some way or or, or form. And I don't disagree with you. I think that same rise is going to manifest itself under existing conditions or under the normal regime of, of, of groundwater flow, but it has to be demonstrated because right now you've left a, a graphic in the record that says the people at 648 Ave or 640 Cannon Ave are going to see nine inches more of groundwater at their property as a function of your project, which, which I don't think is the message. And I've said it before that I don't expect groundwater to be an issue, but but I'm, I'm troubled by the way this sort of is is presented because it, it seems to suggest otherwise. Okay, and, and uh, I guess the only other part I, I mentioned is so you you you're not swayed by this this conversation here, which is that we we expect to see, um, you know, that there's a there's a, a large amount of variation. Um, you know, that was that's kind of the point of having this this discussion in here that we routinely see, um, you know even 16 feet at a 90% confidence interval in, in, until. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that and I, and I believe it, um, but I, I, I don't think you've demonstrated that. So 
what you have demonstrated is that the project will result in a nine inch increase at some properties. What you need to demonstrate is that that is not worse than current conditions or it's it's within the normal sphere of 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 events over the course of the year so so I, it's i think it's just a presentation issue i don't i don't i don't believe there's a problem because of all the factors that you said the size of the system the underlying soil conditions but right now this graphic causes a little bit of concern for me in in the way it's presented okay okay and I'll probably, when I get a good chance to look at this and run it by my hydrogeologist, I'll give you some probably better, more articulate direction. No, I understand what you're saying. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, I understand what you're saying. We, it's just, um, it's too bad that we didn't do that from the beginning. It was, it was, that was not my understanding that we were, that, that, that the purpose of this, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's what you need. So that that's fine. Yep. And, and don't don't the, the the work you did was great, very helpful, very valuable. Because without it, you, there wouldn't be any proof at all. So you know, please don't take this as being sort of sort of overly sure. critical. Um, it's just something that you know, I just don't want to leave it out there the way it's currently um, constructed. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Okay. All right. Um, so I and I think I don't think I have any other. I don't think I have anything else that would kind of address that. So, yeah, I, th I think what, what you're looking for then um, is essentially an evaluation of the existing conditions for a hundred year storm. Okay. Okay. So question for context how many inches of rainfall is a hundred year storm um i don't know if sean or, or rob would be able to answer that a little over eight inches mm -hmm. and, and please keep in mind a hundred year storm doesn't exist it's it's a it's a it's a statistical event created by engineers to model things consistently so you know if you ever hear someone say well that was a hundred year storm it, it, it wasn't it <laughs> so it's just a statistical thing that we use to analyze, but it is, yeah. it, it's critical to making sure we're comparing apples to apples. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's, a, it's a lot of rain over a short period of time. It's a lot of rain, yeah. And just for reference, we get, what, about 42 inches of precipitation a year? Right. So you, what, what, what the 100-year model presumes is that 8.57 inches falls within a 24-hour period. So roughly 20% of your entire rainfall for the year falling in one day. Thank you. That that's helpful. So, you know, understanding the request from Sean, you know, regarding existing conditions, but I think that context is, you know, where we're talking about getting eight and a half inches of rain in a 24 hour period and the groundwater level is rising, you know, six to nine inches. That that just puts that into context. Uh, obviously, we're you know we need to separate out you know what of that rise is caused by the storm itself versus caused by the development. But um, you know it's it, it sounds I guess you know sort of reasonable that you'd expect to see a mound of six to nine inches if you're getting that much rain. Yes. The, the challenge, uh, and I I, re I really understand what you're trying to get at here, Sean. The problem, unfortunately, is that. Um, these models are not event-based models. Um, so um, I'm going to have to think on, on this a little bit as to how, how we're going to do this. Um, I mean, there's some parts of it that are very simple, but there's some other parts of it that are not. So it's, yeah, it's I just, agree it's, with you. Storm water, is, storm water is brutal because it's, it's, it's very, very, very mercurial, very sort of acute. You know, these models are intended to generate stuff for wastewater applications and things like that that have normal yes. distribution right. patterns that, to your point, are introducing new sources of water that didn't exist under current conditions. So, right, exactly. Like, like you have, you have a leach field that's pumping, you know, 1,500 gallons a day, right? So you have right. a standard 1,500 gallon daily pumping rate and uh, versus something that's a short period of time 
uh, I, 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 we'll, we'll be able to figure it out. And, and, and what we need to do is, is provide information that can give neighbors confidence. And, and with all due respect, more confidence than you just saying everything's going to be okay. That, 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 <laughs> that demonstrates confidence confidently that, that the impacts will be a net positive or at least no, no, no worse than they currently are. Right. Right. If I could make a suggestion, Chairman Hurley, uh, obviously this is a very technical high level conversation between experts who understand this at a level that most of us on this call do not. Uh, so my suggestion would be that this conversation be taken offline between Sean and, and Dr. Rosine and our, uh, our civil engineer, Phil Cordero, so they can iron out exactly what it is that Sean is looking to see in the supplemental filing on this, on this topic. I think that's a great idea. Mr. Chair, if I could on that. Sure. We've got a presentation that's sort of done a preliminary evaluation of this. I've got two experts ready to speak to it. Um, they've got some significant concerns, much broader than what Sean uh, has outlined, although I think he's asked some very good and tough questions. Um, and I'd like to uh, have an opportunity to, to have them present. Um, and then we think it's very important that this model be peer reviewed and that the inputs be, be handed to both the peer reviewer and to our consultants so that they can run their own analysis. The, the outputs are only as good as the inputs. And the inputs here are mostly theoretical. They're not based on actual data. We think it's important that we take a look at that. And you'll have an opportunity to present your people at the Thank appropriate you. time. I'm prepared to do it this evening. Um, we can do it next week, whenever, whatever is. Yeah, it just depends on timing. I, I don't know okay. what else Mr. Schomer has in mind to make by way of presentation this evening. Um, my, my suggestion, at least up to this point, is, is that, um, uh, that Mr. Reardon meet with uh, some of the gentlemen and, and or have a conversation to make sure that they're on the same page as to what it is that Mr. Reardon would like to see. And that, at least on that small level, we can probably resolve that when we, when we next meet at, at a public hearing. And I, and I agree that we don't need to do that uh, as part of this hearing this evening. So my only, my only comment on that, Mr. Chair, would be that we've got some, I think, some significant suggestions that ought to be considered when that conversation takes place. Well, I'll let them have the conversation when they want to have the conversation. And uh, uh, if we can get to your people tonight, it makes sense to uh, inject some issues for further conversation, we can do that. But I want, it's, I'm going to let the applicant finish its presentation for this evening, and if we have time, we'll move on to your people. Um, but, but I think we want to follow an orderly process here. So, um, thank you. I think we've had. I think we've probably concluded with this with this presentation, Mr. Schumer. Do you have other things that you want to present this evening? Excuse me. Um, we have two attendees who've had their hands up since the beginning of this presentation. And okay. I'm just, I just want to throw it out there. Should we address that now or wait? That, that's fine. Let's, let's hear from Thank those folks. Thank you. Okay. Denise? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Denise Quayley, 64 Old Farm Road. Um, doctor, thank you for your presentation and, and for the questions from Sean and others. Um, I'm concerned about the wetlands and the intermittent streams that you had mentioned uh, that are more prevalent than not, I think, uh, from my perspective as a property owner and, and a butter, but not a, a direct butter, um, such as the Canton Ave properties. The intermittent streams that scoop around toward Old Farm Road uh, there's a huge gully behind my home. Um, I see that the infiltration systems, number one and number two, are, are I think, abutting those, my property. Um, I'm just interested in, I have a few questions. First of all, how those are monitored and maintained, how long they last, how do they get serviced or replaced if needed? That's my first question. And the second question I had is, um, you had referenced that your topography doesn't come as far as I believe the area that I'm talking about uh, where there are intermittent streams and that gully and, and water that I get all the way over here. 
Um, and I know that there's a lot of water that infiltrates Elm Street and Wenlock, you know, the other side of the of Canton Ave. So I just want to know how those neighborhoods will be affected. Um, you know, and what the baseline is there. If we already get water without a quote unquote hundred year storm, if you're going to be raising the grade seven feet, you know, how is that going to affect my property? Um, so those are the two questions that I have. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think that um, the, the first question about uh, the uh, the monitoring and the maintenance um, of, of these systems, uh, uh, with advanced stormwater management, um, uh, inspection and maintenance is, is really a critical part of it. So a, a typical um, approach is uh, both at either at, a, at the state or at the town level is just to require a annual inspections from uh, qualified personnel. Usually that's a a professional engineer, um, and uh, and the inspection is is to make sure that the systems are are uh, are functioning properly. Um, a well designed system, which I think these systems are well designed, um, um, uh, has some resiliency to it, meaning that there it, it's not like um, something breaks and then it fails. Um, it, it would be a a long term failure over time. Um, so the, the inspection that would be required for these is you've got uh, infil infiltrator systems, which are just, they're basically chambers. They're, they look like a Quonset hut, if you know what that is. It's like a half pipe uh, that's underground. Um, and in some of these, they, they, they're going to wrap them in fabric, I believe. Um, and those, those are the, the, the systems that are cleaned. Um, that's kind of the pre-filter, if you will. And then it flows into the, um, oh, you know what? I actually think I have some... Uh, I have some figures here which could show you that. Um, let's see if this helps. <coughs> Oop, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, but they're basically half pipes that are underground and um, um, and uh, they they can work very very well. Uh, it's 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 an important part. Let's see, is this? Let's actually show the change. The, no, it doesn't. Um, no, I'll have to, I'll have to uh, we'll have to re refer you to some other pieces on here. Um, this is a close up, but doesn't actually show the the the, uh, the dimensions of them. Um, but they, they 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 these systems can work very very well um, if if they're if it's designed and constructed. And uh, and then maintained well. Um, there's, it, it, you know, what, what uh, an easy way to think of them actually is these are. Uh, um, so we, we're all very familiar with leach fields for our septic systems, right? A, a, I don't, a lot of towns ha have a lot of septic systems, um, you know, depending on density. And this, these are essentially um, stormwater leach fields, and uh, like a septic system. A septic system is going to work only as well as as the uh, septic chamber or the box in front is cleaned periodically. You know, typically every two years or thereabouts. Um, and in this case, instead of throwing um, wastewater solids down, we're 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 just we're filling it with sediment and leaves and things like that. Um, and they're captured in a in a chamber on the front end <laughs> that needs to be cleaned periodically. So um, th that that uh, um, so that both the state and the town I would expect would would have uh, an annual inspection uh, and reporting requirement. Um, although I, I'm not entirely sure, uh, we, we might we might actually refer to uh, um, Phil uh, Cordero might be able to answer that a little better um, if if you want. Should we have uh, Phil weigh in on that, or is is that sufficient? Do you think, Jesse? Got a thought? Yeah, I can I can refer uh, Ms. Uh, Keeley to the um, the the project documents that were filed for this uh, include a comprehensive stormwater management report, which includes the operations and maintenance plan for this uh, system, and that has a lot of the the finer details in terms of your question about uh, how frequently the system is maintained and what what specifically that entails. Uh, I see Phil popped up on camera and if he has anything further to add uh, I'll leave it in no just just very quickly uh, Jesse and uh, Rob for the benefit of the chairman uh, uh, Rob hit the, the the points of it uh, we do have an annual inspection program for the subsurface stormwater fields <clears throat> 
They do have inspection ports built into them so we can observe them and they can be cleaned regularly to make sure that that life expectancy is met. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Those details are contained within the master stormwater reports that that's part of the plan. We can we can talk about it in greater detail if further questions arise, but you gentlemen have, have hit the important points of it. So that's something that the developer commits to from the get-go of the project and, and for the for the term of, of the developer's ownership of the project, they're, they're committed to do that. Is that correct? And, and the town has a has a uh, has a role in that in terms of making sure it's enforced. Uh, but if the developer chooses to to sell the property or anything like that, what happens there? Does it does it does it go with the sale of the property? Or, you know, I just want to make sure that these things. You know, I, I'm an attorney, but I'm also a plumber's wife, so I, I, I understand leaching fields and problems with pipes and, and what it can do. So I just want to make sure that it's maintained in perpetuity and not just uh, with the current developer. It, it, uh, it does run in perpetuity to the project. It is not owner specific. So really where the document lives, we have the operation and maintenance plan that's packaged into the drainage report. It's packaged under the Massachusetts stormwater standards, which are also inherent to the Wetlands Protection Act. So when this, uh, assuming this project ultimately receives the order of conditions from the Milton Conservation Commission under the state act, um, that's where it'll be further refined and required that the operation and maintenance plan be performed annually and complied with as outlined in that document. Uh, and the order of conditions uh, runs with the project. It's not owner specific. It is a lien on the project that will stay in effect for the entirety of its lifespan. Thank you. And the second part of my question had to do with the, um, you know, the fact yeah. that the topography doesn't go as far as I believe, you know, and I'm sorry that I'm being um, selfish in, in asking about my side of the of the line um, as not a director of a butter. I am very concerned about the other abutters on Canton Ave as well as across the street on Elm and Gulliver, because I know that they experience extreme flooding and, and Milton has had some extreme flooding in that area as well as in you know, other parts of Milton, uh, we have family on Garden Street, for instance, in Milton, uh, it, it happens a lot. Um, so I don't have a Rembrandt in my basement, but I am concerned about, um, you know, problems with, with flooding my basement and, and ruining my property. Yeah. So um, if you could- Yeah, no, these, 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 these are very, very good questions uh, and very legitimate. So, so no need to apologize for them at all. Um, you know, yeah, as I, I I work for folks, you know, pro and 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 against development all the time. And you always tell folks that, that what, what you can hope for is that your involvement in the project makes this project the best it can be for that site. And um, you know, and, and that's what you that's exactly what you want. And and so uh, you know, uh, um, so what, what I want to distinguish between a few things here because one one of the things that this model does not do is it does not evaluate surface water flooding. And so th that was that was the work that was done by uh, uh, Phil Cordero and, and, and his group, um, and that is the uh, that's that's the, essentially the stormwater management component of this. And um, what we what and I'll just summarize, and Phil can correct me if I'm if I, if I'm wrong here, but you know essentially what what is being done here is um, you you, do, you have a series of of detention and infiltration systems, and and I'm I'm not trying to overly complicate it in terms of description. I'm, I'm trying to just answer what you're saying here but um my, my point being that the stormwater that's generated from this site should not exacerbate flooding elsewhere it's not going to solve flooding that's elsewhere but it should not exacerbate it and why that is if you remember um what, what i was describing early on if you know this site generate uh, handles a certain amount of water to begin with as long as we're not um um creating more runoff that would cause downstream flooding that's our pre, that's our primary uh, concern, really, with stormwater management in a lot of cases, and that's why we where we're required to meet the hundred year storms and all these other ones, the two year, the five year, the ten year, et cetera, whatever they are. And 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 that's what this site does very very well with all the infiltration systems. So so I mean they're functioning well and all of that. Uh, it'll run. It'll it'll the, the site will absorb it like a sponge. Some of it'll go back into the ground, and then the, the remainder should run down, you know, through the storm drains and in, into the uh, Milton stormwater sewer, storm sewers. Um, so I think some of the flooding that we're talking about here, uh, unfortunately, is is really, uh, and I hate to say this because it's it's not a satisfying 
answer. I feel like I'm, I'm giving a lot of these ones tonight, but it's uh, it's a bigger question than than this pro than than these studies are 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 um, um, expected to to answer. So, like kind of the the, the regional or even um, sub watershed scale flooding analysis is it is an important one. It's not one that's done here. It's not one that's required. Um, and and uh, um, I, I I can tell you though that that the um, given uh, how how um, the topography is here, um, that you you you're not you're not going to expect that this site is going to contribute to any other flooding because it this site is managing itself internally, uh, right? So if this site was discharging to say the uh, the um, the uh, the south, um, uh, th then you would you might worry about flooding there, uh, but it's not, um, and uh, so. I, I, I apologize. I realize that's it's not it, it's probably not as as thorough an answer as 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 you're as you're le looking for here. But it, it's it's kind of beyond what what any of our models uh, can can um, uh, can answer uh, on, on the larger scale. And 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 to your point, yes, the topography ends kind of a, a slightly larger than than the site, so we don't really examine the larger impacts. Um, but it, that doesn't change my um, my my overall statement, which is that um, you expect groundwater mounding at the infiltration systems, and then it dissipates uh, with distance and time away. So by the time you're at the edge of the property, uh, you're really not expected. You, you should it, it shouldn't be any any different at the site scale than it was prior. Okay. Thank you. Was there someone else that you had? Yes, on the... there, yes there is. Uh, Mike Kelly? Mike? Mr. Kelly? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Mike Kelly, 132 Whittier Road. Uh, I, I am a civil engineer, but structural. So this is, uh, I run into these things, but not often. Uh, addressing Mr. Rosen, I was curious when it was asked of you if you had enough information to do a pre-construction analysis. And in fact, it seemed like the answer was obvious to me because for lack of better terminology, you're working off regional data, information out of a book, like you acknowledge yourself, that there's been no test wells for the, you know, monitoring the water levels. And then you also talk about till and up to 16 feet of, uh, elevation change in the water table until, and it may have been done, but I'm not aware of it. Are there borings done to show that this site is all till? And, I, and if there is, I would do borings to at least 20, 25 feet to prove that this is all till like you uh, elaborated. And lastly, uh, I'd be curious if you'd loan your uh, thoughts on the difference between doing an analysis, having site specific information versus using, again, I'll just use the terminology to cover what I'm trying to get at, regional site data, and how much more uh, accurate site data might make that analysis. Thank you, I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you raised the question. I, I don't know where the idea is coming from that, that it's, it's regional generalized data. Uh, I heard Mr. Corcoran say that earlier, that that is not true. Um, the um, uh, there is so, there is some information that is that it comes from USGS studies and things like that, but there's a lot of, of very site specific data here. Um, so the um, um, if if you look at this, this is these are these are the test pits here that were done, and there were I can't remember 15 tests. Yeah, here it is, 15 test pits, and and every one of them confirms uh, glacial till. And so what we know is uh, the test pits were done. Um, I believe that's in the uh, in the report, also, um, you don't know off the top of your head to what depth they were. I I, I do, and uh, well, off the top of my head, no, but I have them right here in the t in the table here. So let me just take a quick look, if you don't mind. Let's do. Um, um, yeah, here we go. Oh, there we go. So um, depth. So this this uh, there there some of their um, of them are as deep as ten feet. Um, so th this is this is pretty standard for um, you know for test pits. So they're 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 you know, anywhere. But, but wouldn't you say that if you're telling me that 
it could fluctuate 16 feet until I would expect that all that 16 feet be until. And if you've only gone to 10 feet that you haven't proved to me that you have 16 feet or more of till there. Right. I mean, I would do a boring, I would do a core boring right down 25 feet, pick it up and tell me where I'm at every, the first five feet is till, the next five feet is till, the next five feet may be something different. And I'd be curious how many test pits rather than borings were done around the site because I've been on sites where we've, we've expected a subsurface condition and, and moved over five feet and lo and behold, it's completely different than it was expected. Sure, sure. No, it's it's a good point. Um, uh, so um, I, I think I think what what I what I would say is that the uh, uh, what we modeled here was was uh, was on the safe or conservative side. So um, you can see that the, the the test pits range from 72 inches to 120 inches. And I I think what I did was just average them. Um, and so I used an average um, uh, layer thickness of I want to say it was approximately nine feet. Um, so um uh if i used even more it would be it would it would it would um it would only improve the model conditions in terms of storage meaning meaning you would have uh you would see less impact so the thinner that's the till layer uh the less storage the the greater the till layer the more the storage um so uh, oh, so you so you're planning on having a complete layer of till and in other words if i brought in if i introduce a different material down below 10 feet, it, it may change it in a negative direction. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you, if we have 10 feet down, we, you know, just beyond that 10 foot mark, we, we saw a, a, a Boston blue clay. Well, actually, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if there was a Boston blue, it, it would be no different because I've already, we've already modeled it as bedrock. So we've already modeled it as, as sort of a worst case scenario. So if, if we did 25 foot um, borings, which would be great, but completely unusual for this type of project, but I, I know where you're going with this. You, you, what you're talking about it makes perfect sense. How to make a better model? You know, if if, if we did, you know, thirty when you, when you say this type, foot. When or, you say this type of project, you mean what a residential project? Yeah, a uh, versus yeah, yeah. a versus a twenty-five story building with a you know more significant foundation. Yeah, and again, yeah. I'm thinking structural. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, for structural, for sure, where we're talking about a building foundation. In this case, what I mean is 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 just for mass stormwater permitting. I realized uh, that that I, I I was a bit off the mark. I, I I thought we were doing this for mass stormwater permitting. I didn't realize it was as much for the uh, butter issues. But um, and and that's my bad. Um, so if the, this uh, was a, if this was a single family home that could change the you know the water drainage, would this same uh, analysis be required? No way, not in a million years. No, not in okay. a million years. What this is, this is, this is so beyond. Where, what where's you would the, do. where's the, where's the cutoff? Where do you, where does the project uh, fall into the category where this needs to be supplied? Well, uh, so the the main piece is is that if they had four foot of separation from seasonal high, um, that they could have, uh, um, you can do this without without this this level of complexity. Um, and you could do, you know, uh, you basically need a, a test pit for every infiltration system. So we have 15 inf infiltrations, you know, 15 test pits, um, and you know, there's four infiltration systems. Now, granted, uh, one of them is enormous, but there's more than sufficient test pits for the number of infiltration systems that are out here. Um, so you could do it with just a normal Excel spreadsheet. Um, uh, in in uh, typically is, is how you would do that. Would Would you have liked seen uh, test wells? Sure. I mean, the more you have, the better it is. Uh, um, I mean, you can make a model as, as good as you want it. Um, you know, Mr. Corcoran said garbage in, garbage out. Uh, this is hardly garbage, but it is. It, it, but could it be better? Yes, no question. Um, is it useful? Yes. Um, is, is it is it is it a, a level of design uh, and planning model? Yes. Um, but but this, obviously, we need to answer some additional questions here, and I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not um, arguing. Yeah. This this I but again, I'd be curious what your level of, uh, of uh, uh, confidence would be if you had more site-specific test data like the test wells versus not having it. And lastly, I'd like to just say that, you know, when you're talking about the complexity and what's absolutely required, I mean, yep. you've been in this area, it's, it's probably not, it's probably a tangent or off topic here a little bit, but this is a mega project for this area. I understand. 
Yeah. So it is I a understand. significant this is a significant impact in just itself. Yeah. So the confidence of what it could do becomes significant. I understand. In the, I, in, the, I, in the level of confidence to say you ain't going to see an additional impact is supreme. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Thank that you. Makes, yeah. Thank you. Emily, is there anyone else? Yes. Um, the Janagas, Mr. or Mrs. I'm not sure which. Okay. And after that? One more, Ken Roach. Okay. Let's have these two. Okay. I think, I think Sean Fagan has his hand raised as well. This is Stan Janiga sitting here with my daughter, Beth, who owns the property at uh, 658 Canton Avenue. Uh, one comment and one question. Uh, I find it interesting that you talk about three adjoining properties and don't mention at all uh, 658 Canton Avenue, which is her property with uh, significant wetlands 30 to 35 feet off the rear foundation and a stream on the east side. Uh, my question is, uh, I've listened to all of the comments about a drainage system, and I, I don't claim to be an expert in that, nor do I claim to be an expert in water movement, and water mounting and those things. But I sit here and say to myself that based on what I've heard, the 50,000 plus cubic yards of fill are going to function as an integral part of that drainage system. That is, that's if correct. that soil doesn't drain uh, in, in, in a fashion that will support what you're saying will happen to the water. So my question becomes, what are the specifications for that fill? It seems to me you can't put in any old dirt, if you will, but you've got to have specifications for that fill such that the conclusions you're drawing about what will happen to the water will in fact be accurate. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, well, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let Phil answer the question about the spec, uh, sorry, Phil Cordero, <laughs> answer the questions about the, uh, um, uh, the fill material specifications. Uh, but but let, let, me, uh, let me just say that um, from a modeling perspective, we actually did not factor in the um, um, added quality uh, or storage capacity of a, uh, a better fill, if you will. Um, we wouldn't fill with a till. Uh, till typically has fairly low load bearing capacity, so it's not great to build on. So, uh, but I'm not entirely sure what the, what the fill material is that would be brought in, but I assume it would be a, a sand and gravel mix. Um, and, uh, but um, because we didn't factor that in, in terms of the model, um, it, it makes the model conservative. It's a little bit as almost similar to Mike Kelly's comment. Um, we could have done deeper borings and all of that stuff, but what we did is we made some assumptions that were um, uh, um, conservative, meaning it, it only would have reduced the model performance. Meaning if I had a 25 foot layer of till, it, um, it would have been even easier, but I didn't have 25 foot test pits. I had 10 foot test pits, which are, are really, they're deep and standard test pits. Um, so I don't, I hope I, I, I Mr. Ganega, I'm not entirely sure I've answered your question, but let, let me, let me pause for one moment. Let me uh, let Phil Cordero answer the question about the fill specification material. And then let's see if, if we get, if we answer your question. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Rob. Um, through the chair to answer Mr. Janiga's question, uh, we'll obviously specify a granular fill underneath the stormwater system. So yeah, obviously Robert Rosine and I, and certainly Sean Reed and then others on this call uh, play in the same sandbox in terms of stormwater management. Um, so we would have expected him to do the analysis exactly as he did, which is to denote that the fill underneath the, underneath the stormwater systems will be of a select variety but not necessarily to take it as additional capacity to thereby build in that factor of safety and conservative approach to it. So um, we'll specify specific material, specific granular fill underneath those stormwater systems. So they do function as Robert has laid out here this evening. Did that answer your question, Mr. Janiga, to uh, through the chair? Yeah. Yeah, it did, but it seems to me that that specification is uh, is overdue since it's a significant issue 
given, given the size of the fill and so forth. And so while I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, it's been indicated that that's what will be specified, uh, it seems to me that that's overdue on being done, but that, that's my nickel's worth and that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Beverly, did you say there was one more person? Yes. Okay. Ken Roche. Yes, hi, Ken Roach, 44 Holmes Lane. Uh, just a couple questions. Is it? Do you have the test pits located on that model that are sh that's shown on the screen right now in that figure nine? Are they overlaid on there anywhere? Let's see. Or right, yes, some or of them. You, yeah. I mean, how yeah. many are in that system too? The the monstrous one that goes across the whole height of the site. How many test pits are in that area? Oh boy. Um, I think there's four. Underneath those drainage systems? Yeah, I think there's four. Yeah. Yeah, there's 15 test pits in total. Um, let's see if, um, they don't show up very well just because of the coloring. Um, there's 15 test pits. There was actually nine used for the model because I just used, uh, I w just wanted to use the wet weather ones, but I, I could have used all, uh, all 15 of them. I, I did not, but it's, it's sort of six of one half dozen of the other. Um, but uh, so here's, so here's the test pits. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly where they all are. There's, let's see. So you wanted to know where they are under the big, big ones. So the big, big one is in I'm relation to any, yeah, in relation to any of the infiltration systems to the drainage systems. Yeah, let's do this real quick. I we'll know just... there's quite variants of groundwater yeah. levels between yeah, yeah. 15 test pits. Right. So there's one. Um, where are they all? There's, a, I think there's another one right in here too somewhere. Where are they? There's another one. There's another one. Um, yeah. So there's 15 of them. Um, I mean, and they're all in the, they're all within the general vicinity of the infiltration system. The system. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the only data that was used? Or did you use the, the ports that were installed on site? The what that were installed on site? Well, I know they had installed some, I won't say monitoring wells, but some kind of ports. Oh, uh, right. Months back, <clears throat> were any of that used? No, those were not used. Those, uh, just the test pits. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. I don't know if we could see that clearly marked out where those test pits are in relationship to the to the drainage structures. I, I thought they were more in the perimeter. I know there was some done at a later date that I'm not familiar with, but the original eight or nine were definitely, I know four of them were down towards the northern end of, to closer to Canton Ave where there's nothing. So right. I don't know what ones are in that same vicinity of all those drainage systems, but. Okay. My next yeah, question that, would that, be, go ahead. We, yeah, so we I'll, I'll do that. We'll make sure that they're uh, they're called out uh, more clearly. They're they are um, uh, they're listed in the report currently in the back. Uh, you can see them all here, but they they're not identified like this. I think in, this is I've the majority. Seen them on the existing conditions plans and. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. It's okay. Tough to yeah. See where they are in relationship to this, but. Understood. Yep. Next question is: Is there any grades or any elevations of the existing streams that run along the property? Yeah, there yeah this, there's this right here, yeah. Yeah, so the wetland flags here along the intermittent stream are all, are, are all um, are part of the topography here, yeah. And then I know in previous meetings, um, Mr. Chair, we have, the neighbors have requested that the Janaga property be staked so we I mean, that, that wetland seems to be forgotten about quite a bit. And I think that's one of the more substantial 
wetlands in the immediate vicinity of the property. Is that this one out here? That's this wetland here, right? I can't see your mouse. Oh, you can't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 the back of the yeah. site, the far south of the site that Mr. Janago was just referencing. Okay. Thank you. So I, I know it has been requested for that to be staked. So there's relative information of how the this site, proposed site, would impact those. And I mean, we don't know the distance, or and I don't think those wetlands have ever been staked or flagged. And there's, there's very minimal information on those wetlands. I know that was a request a few meetings back, and I don't know if we ever got a response from that. We missed it, but I think that's something the neighbors should be able to see. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure I know exactly where that would be. We, we, we show those weapons. Is that something we can do? Can, can you see my cursor? Uh, not well. Not well, huh? Okay. How about now? Not at all. <laughs> Are we looking at figure nine right now? Is that what we're looking at? Oh boy, weird. Okay, I must have shared something else. Oh boy, I wonder how long we've been doing that. Where I've been, <laughs> thought I was showing you something that I wasn't. So have you? Have you guys not seen when I've zoomed in on my report? You probably haven't been. Oh boy, look at that. Yeah. Okay. So I studied, shared my. Uh, all right. I'm sorry about that. Gosh, technology. How about now? Do you see it now? Yes. Yes. Oh, so that means a whole bunch of conversation we were having. You didn't even know what I, I was talking about something, something that <laughs> I was pointing to. You didn't even see. I'm sorry about that. Oh yeah. All right. Well, so here, here's here's what um, Mr. Roach and I were just discussing. This is what I was trying to show you, Mr. Roach. The uh, this these are the uh, test pits shown here in red, and um, uh, so there's there's actually quite a few up up in that upper area. Um, but so this is the wetland you're talking about. And this, and this is just go back. Let's go back to the, those test pits quick right there. Yeah. You know, all the ones in the north that if you zoom out a little bit so everyone can see all the. The first we're just working left to right on the screen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Have, they're nowhere near a drainage system, correct? I think we yeah, I, mean, I think more or less that that's a fair statement. Sure. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out 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 here, right? So you have seven. Are any of them actually underneath the infiltration systems? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I mean, they that, are. And 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 your your point was noted. You want to see the test pits on the ground. That test pit now. twelve is outside of any well outside the drainage systems, I believe, unless it's a. Unless I'm viewing it wrong, but which is very possible. I, I think that's actually probably right under uh, that might be almost under infiltration system one because the uh, the um, uh, the road comes right down in here and the infiltration system one is right next to it. Um, but that, we, that's but, that's correct, Rob. It, it's yeah. underneath inf infiltration system one. Yeah. And you've outlined the other test bits that surround and go underneath or on the perimeter of infiltration system two. And then just for clarity of the uh, the homeowner's comments, the test pits at the front of the site were done, were the, were the initial test pits done for the stormwater design that was under the initial submission. So we're no longer utilizing those areas for stormwater right now. So that's why they they appear to be outside of our stormwater zone it's because they they were under the previous design. Just for clarity for the group. Yeah, that's understood. So you're really working off of seven test pits and not the 15 that were referenced. Well, uh, y yes and no. I mean, uh, we're using test pits for different pur pur purposes. The test pits are are for, um, so, you know, uh, for, let, let's say for, um, we need all the test pits to characterize essentially the glacial till, right? Um, so that, that yeah. helps us understand. Water. I mean, specifically groundwater. 
Well, no, I, because you, you need it, all, all the test pits are used for for calibration of the groundwater levels in the model. So uh, the more test pits, the better. You kind of want them on all sides of your model. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, frankly, I think this is this is a lot of test pits, and it's good, uh, and, and not that there couldn't be more, but uh, it, it, it's this is this is not uh, there's not a lack, in my opinion, uh, for studies that I've seen, there's not a lack of test pit data, and, and and one of the reasons why I would say that is where you might ask if there was if there was an insufficient amount would be are we seeing something different? But every test pit is identical: sandy loam, sandy loam, sandy loam, sandy loam. They all have roughly the same. Um, same characteristics, same depth to groundwater. You know, we saw bedrock in one um, and uh, at I think nine feet or something like that. I don't remember which one it is, but it's in the tables. Um, and then the other ones, they're just all, you know, it's just 10 feet or, or thereabouts of, of, of sandy loam. So it, 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 the point of the test pits really is just to characterize the site. And, and, uh, and, it, and it has done that. If, if I was seeing, oh, I've now I, I've got a clay hit over here. I've got a clay hit over here. Then I would start to refine my 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 tests. Okay, and then the the wetlands back in the back of the Janaga property that you were saying they are flagged. No, I, I did not say that. I'm going to let Phil Phil respond to that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess my initial thought on that would just be that that's that's off the pro that's off the project site. So that that's probably the reason why it hasn't been flagged. But Phil, do you want to answer that? Well, that that that's it exactly, Rob. Is we've had we have it located based on mass GIS plotting. It is located off the property. We know that there's a buffer that extends onto the land, and we've 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 captured it obviously graphically here on these plans, and we'll capture it through the conservation commission. But to be clear, it's not been physically flagged and located in the field. There's no concerns of drainage or anything taken away from that levels of that wetland and no back to the same through the chair through through the chair to answer the um, the homeowner's question you know we're, we're obviously aware of those wetlands just like we are aware of the wetlands on the merge wood drive side of the project and everything is is treated the same from the stormwater management perspective uh, we're required to handle everything within the property limits, and that ultimately respects the presence of those wetlands. And then as Dr. Rosine has pointed out here this evening, his stormwater model uh, doesn't need to respect property limits, but he's factored in all of those environmental considerations in terms of his overall model, in terms of how that groundwater wants to move or will move uh, relative to the subsurface features. So. Uh, even though the wetlands are not flagged, they are most definitely factored into both equations on the stormwater design side and this mounding analysis that was discussed tonight. Okay, thank you. So we've Chair, covered all the Mr. Chair, Sean Fahey's had his hand up. I'm not sure whether Bev has noticed it, but his hand's been up for a while. I have noticed it but we were letting the attendees answer um, um, because we had to go in order of them. And I didn't fine. want to interrupt that. Okay, that's fine. Mr. Fay, you're right. the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Rosine, I, uh, I live on Old Farm Road. I'm just a little bit further down the road from Denise uh, Quayle, who spoke earlier and um, Notwithstanding any of the comments of Denise or Mike Kelly or Stan or Ken, I had a, a few comments that I, I would like to make to address your presentation tonight. And thank you for your presentation. It was it was valuable and, and helpful. Um, the uh, just by background, I have 35 years of experience in commercial construction. I lead a a um, a. $200 million a year commercial construction company and have built throughout New England through my last 35 years and have dealt with complicated site conditions throughout my career. So I have, I have uh, experience in, in uh, site development and um, conditions uh, that come along with site development. I've had concern for the, um, the design, the stormwater design, certainly for an awful long time. And um, I, I appreciate what you're prepared, but my concerns haven't been alleviated. And I, I do look forward 
to uh, a, a, I guess, a further presentation following Sean Redden's uh, comments earlier tonight um, and probably some of the other comments that have been made. But I, I guess what, what really concerns me, and I go back to the beginning um, of your presentation when you responded to uh, Chair Hurley's questions, um, and these are your statements. Uh, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Models are not entirely accurate, but useful. Subsurface groundwater characterization is very difficult to develop. It's like characterizing an elephant in a dark room. There is a fair amount we don't know. So when I consider what is being asked of by the applicant here, uh, the size and scale of the project and the required stormwater management system, what really concerns me is if this design doesn't work and if your model is not accurate and reliable, the impact is not on the developer. The impact will be on the adjacent properties and the impact will be on the town of Milton. The water that will be relieved from the site uh, through the, the overflow connection out into the public drainage system. You had made a comment earlier that this is good stormwater management. I, I have a very, very hard time based on my experience accepting that. Um, a site that requires the import of fill to the extent that this site requires um, depths as great as seven feet and even in one area, nine feet. That's 3,300, that 3,300 tractor trailer loads of material to come onto a site. It is an infiltration system. By my calculation, that is almost 20% of the impervious area. I have never seen a site with so much square footage of infiltration system by percentage of impervious, impervious area. It does not strike me at all that this is good stormwater management. Rather, I see this as extreme stormwater management. So my concerns remain. I think the town is at risk. I think the neighbors are at risk. And while I appreciate your presentation tonight, I think we have a way to go to try to prove that this design will work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Do you have anyone else? Uh, Stan Janiga here again. I, I just would like to clear up uh, one thing. Folks were asking the question about where the Janiga property was. It's at the end of the proposed development opposite Canton Avenue, if that helps some. Uh, the only other comment I would make is I heard the comment that we didn't show any impacts there, but we considered them. And quite frankly, that rings really hollow to me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the hour is growing I'm so, I'm sorry. You... Just Ned, and that'll be it. Okay, I, I Ned, mean, you... that was it for the attendees. Okay, great. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I, I would appreciate an opportunity for Sean, uh, excuse me, for Scott Horsley and um, Mike Mobile to speak preliminarily to what we've heard tonight. I think they've got some ideas that would be helpful uh, in, in uh, consideration. When you say preliminarily, we, we mean you expect- They have done a back? very preliminary analysis of the report that was done. They've got questions about um, assumptions being made, and I think it's important that the board hear those and that Sean Reardon hear those so that he can take those into consideration relative to how we move forward. Are they, are they going to subsequently give us written reports or evaluations? Yes, we haven't had time to, to do that because, you know, we, we just got this a week ago. I understand. I mean, do you think we'll have something by the time we have the next public hearing next week? Yes. Okay. I mean, because it's as a board member, I can't speak for the other two board members. 
I, I need to see this stuff in writing because right? I can't, I can't, I just can't take all of this in orally as it's presented to us. Um, so it's enormously important that we get, you know, good written materials that we can sit back and digest in the, in the comfort of uh, being alone with them. Uh, so I think that's critical. But I'm happy to have sort of a preview of what we'll see in writing uh, briefly this evening. That'd be great. And if I have permission to share the screen, I have a handful of slides that we can run through. Chairman yes, Hurley, if I may, I have, a, I have a brief response to, to Mr. Corcoran. Um, sure. Thank you. We, we have a couple of other matters to still to be discussed tonight on a different topic. And, and frankly, I would object to presentation from, from Mr. Cochran's uh, expert witnesses, as he has styled them, um, on the, for the reason that, you know, it's not helpful, in my opinion, for our consultants, for the board members, for Mr. Reardon, to have, as it were, a trial by ambush here. And, you know, to, to, to employ the old phrase, what's good, good for the goose is good for the gander. We were implored to file our materials in writing well in advance of the hearing. And uh, I would request the same of uh, Attorney Cochran and his consultants that, that anything that they have to say be filed in writing so that we can have a, an opportunity to review that and respond to it in an informed manner during the hearing, uh, rather than just uh, putting, putting a, opinion statements and preliminary remarks on the record without an opportunity to rebut them in an informed manner. I, I take your point, um, but they are gonna, that, that was why I asked the question whether we were gonna get written submissions in advance of the next public hearing so that you you will have that opportunity to rebut. But uh, I, I'm going to, as long as my full board members agree with me, I'm gonna have, let them speak very briefly tonight um, uh, since they're here and, uh, and I, and I do mean briefly, because I, I agree, it, the, the hour is getting late and I, I put more stock in what I can read than what I can hear. Uh, but that said, I think we can allow them to speak briefly and by way of sort of uh, introduction and anticipation of what we're gonna get in writing. Ted, and Mike, do you, Ted Mike, do you, do you agree with that approach? I do. I do too. Okay, so let's let's give it just please just do it by way of sort of uh, what we can anticipate by way of written materials and, and let's let's keep it brief for this evening. You you can have all the opportunity you want next week to expand on on your written materials. I appreciate that. I I, I just would like to respond to the last comment. The last comment. Um, there's been a lot of submissions that stuff is filed on the day of a hearing. There's been presentations made. We have had very little opportunity to review and to be prepared to respond to com and comment uh, in these in the process of these hearings. Um, uh, th I'm not trying to ambush anybody. We just got this information as you did over the weekend. Uh, we've had a time to just quick look at it. If it questions, we think it's important to identify and just move forward. And we will have uh, a more detailed set of uh, reports to file by the end of next week, uh, so the board has it in time to review before uh, next hearing. The next hearing is when? When do we schedule the next hearing for? I think it's generally every Tuesday, so. So you'll have a before next Tuesday's hearing? We'll have some materials ready to prepare uh, before next Tuesday's hearing, yes. Okay, that's fine. If I could make a suggestion, Chairman Hurley, since we, it, since it sounds like we need to have a meeting between Mr. Reardon and Dr. Ozeen anyway, my suggestion would be that we have the next hearing two weeks from tonight and Attorney Corcoran's submission be filed by next Tuesday so that the board and we and Mr. Reardon have a full week to review their, their responses to our submission, which I would remind uh, Attorney Corcoran, the mounting analysis was filed 11 days ago, not, not over the weekend. It got to my inbox at nine o'clock on Friday night. All right, it, it, it makes sense to me, frankly, that we do it that way. I, I and I defer it to Mike and, and Ted on this, but uh, getting the written materials a week in advance of the hearing is would be extremely helpful to us, I think, to the board members. Um, we're not 
scientists or engineers and, and absolutely speaking only for myself, I need time to uh, comprehend and assimilate this material. And if I'm getting it on, you know, Tuesday morning, uh, given that I'm a practicing lawyer and I actually bill a few hours every day, um, I, I just don't have the time. So I, I think putting it off for a week, I think having the written materials from your experts, Ned, by next uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, in anticipation of a hearing the following Tuesday, I think is probably the best way to go. That's fine. So that's a good suggestion. Yeah, so I, 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 I accept that completely. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, so what, let's just hear briefly from these two individuals and then we'll look forward to their written materials. Um, okay, I guess uh, Mr. Rosine needs to stop sharing his screen. Okay, I'm sure he's happy to do that. Okay. And, um, um, Scott? You want me to share my screen? I think I've yeah. got the presentation. Uh, can you see that okay? Questions about the model? Somebody? I do see visible? that. Okay, yes. thank you. And I will, I will be brief, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to share these preliminary comments. Um, and uh, these are questions, but I think they're important questions. And I will suggest that some of these points we're gonna make go very much to the questions raised by the board members tonight. And uh, as Sean Reardon pointed out, we too asked the question about why, did, uh, if, I, if I may on the lower right there, why does the blue line, which is the estimated uh, seasonal high water table start below excuse me, why does the, the blue line start below the estimated seasonal high water table? Uh, I think Rob's, Rosine's response was correct, and that is that the model is not accurate, that accurate to show that, but this is certainly something that could be adjusted. And as I'll show you in a previous slide, um, that has an effect, obviously it's additive on where the mound would be. So the model can be further calibrated such that that line starts where it, it, it uh, matches the, existing condition. Uh, the next bullet, the 4.7 inches is the, is the recharge rate that I believe uh, Rob used in the model. And, and I agree with what he said at the beginning, that it's important that pre-development recharge rates equal post-development recharge rates. Um, and that's been a comment that I've submitted in at least two letters in the past that I have a big concern because in fact, that's not the case here at all. Uh, this project uh, proposes to uh, use a stormwater volume roughly five times more than the existing rates. Uh, my third bullet suggests that I believe that the post-development annual recharge rate is closer to 20 inches, which is obviously much higher than the 4.7. And again, I would agree with Rob, if that's the case, we have some issues with the model. And I'm, I'm not sure how that squares, but I would be more than happy to go through how I derive that 20 inches. I, won't, I certainly won't do it right now, but I will put it in my letter, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and then the last comment here is that I believe that the modeling, the mounding modeling should take into account this increase in annual recharge. And again, this is a comment that is in writing. I believe it's in two prior letters, Mr. Chairman, uh, that was provided to the applicants. So this, there should be no news here. This is a comment that I've made, again, at least twice. Um, so let me go to the next slide. And what I've got here is a blow up of one of these just to illustrate. This is system number one. And again, we can see, if you can see my cursor, the modeled water table starts below the estimated seasonal high. Uh, I think for the model to be more accurate, that should be adjusted and calibrated such that it starts here. And I'm showing that here. This, this could be the adjustment. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Mike Mobile in a minute and he can explain uh, briefly how this can be done because he uh, uh, eats and sleeps this stuff every day. But this certainly could be uh, calibrated such that as uh, Mr. Reardon mentioned, the model does start in let's say the correct place, okay? And if I go to the next slide, uh, this would take into account what I'm suggesting that the post-development annual recharge rate is substantially higher than the existing rate. And what this would suggest that there would be an additional adjustment to the model to provide for that. So I believe there are two components that need to be added here. And again, we'll provide details on 
what those are, why those are, and if we need to, how to do it. Um, we would like to, as, as Attorney Corcoran mentioned, we were requesting the modeling files because without those, we really can't see the details of what was done. And uh, that will help us make suggestions on how to make the model more accurate, uh, which I think everybody wants. Um, what I did do here is plot the wetland boundary because as uh, Rob was incorrectly said, it's very difficult to see things on these illustrations. Um, so, uh, and, and, and one of the requirements for Mass DEP is to evaluate impact, impacts on the wetland. I'm calling your attention to one point in this, uh, this is actually a corner of the bordering vegetated wetland. The, and, the, and you'll notice the, this is figure nine from Rod's report. This is showing the elevation at that point at 114.7. And then if we go to his next slide, which is the uh, modeling with the 100 year storm, we can see that does go up to 116.2. That's a 1.5 foot increase at the location of the wetland. And as uh, I think it's been pretty clearly stated that this is in fact a mass DEP requirement to look at um, changes in water sheet elevation within the wetland and also for breakouts. Uh, there is a fairly steep slope in that well in that area. Um, I'm going to go back there later this week and take a look at some of the surrounding areas to verify the, the details of that slope, but I think that's going to require some more attention. And I'll leave that at that. And uh, I did want to just point out clearly, we, we've requested again in the two prior letters that this wetland here in the back property be delineated. I, I think this is a really important feature here. And I don't understand why uh, the other wetland that has been delineated is also off the property. So the rationale given tonight is that it wasn't done because it's not on the property. I don't quite follow that because the other wetland that is delineated is also not on the property and it's almost equal distance. So this is a headwater wetland to the stream and I've talked about this at prior meetings. I think it's critical that that gets delineated and that the model uh, domain be expanded to include impacts on that wetland and again, I believe that is required by Mass DEP as well. And uh, I think I will wrap up on this one. Um, I think there are some other issues that have been raised tonight about the fill. Um, I, I, it's, it's not here, but I'll mention uh, one of the critical inputs to the model is the permeability or hydraulic, con hydraulic conductivity values. Uh, those, were, those were taken from literature values, best estimate as opposed to on-site tests. That's something that can be done. It's not expensive, doesn't take much time. And we would view that as a really critical step to get on-site permeability tests for each of the infiltration systems and not use literature values. Because as I think Dr. Rosine said, and I agree with him 100%, glacial till is highly variable. Huge ranges of permeability. We won't know what they are on-site unless we do the permeability tests. Again, they're easy to do. They're not expensive. They don't take much time and it's something that clearly should be done. Uh, at this point, Mr. Chair, what I'd like to do is just introduce Dr. Mike Mobile. I recommended we bring him into this project. I've worked with him on several other projects. He works for a firm by the name of McDonald and Morrissey. Um, Dr. McDonald is, is one of the individuals who developed the mod flow model that we're talking about. As, as Dr. Rosine mentioned, that was prepared by the US Geological Survey by Mr. McDonald, who started the firm that uh, Mike Mobile works for. Mike um, does groundwater modeling using this model, I would say pretty darn close to full time, which is why I recommended him. Uh, he's taken a quick look at this. And I, would, I would just like to introduce him. I think he has no more than three minutes of comments to add to mine. I don't think he has any slides. So Mike, if I, if it's for you, Mr. Chair, if I could just introduce Dr. Mobile. That's fine. Can I just ask, please elaborate on these points that you've raised tonight, none of which have completely sunk in during the hour. Uh, in, in your written materials and, and write it, focusing on me in particular, write it for idiots. Um, because that's, <laughs> I, that's, I, that's I was, the level that I operate on. So um, well, I would appreciate I think, that. I will certainly uh, detail all of these points. As I've indicated, uh, I think half of these points I addressed tonight are in my prior two letters. This is not- I'm, really I'm sure they are. But, but I'm gonna reiterate it and, and I will do it in a very uh, clear way, Mr. Okay. Chairman. So appreciate thank you. it. Um, Mike, if you're here, I'll turn it over to you. I, I don't know. And I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, board members. As Scott mentioned, my name is Mike Mobile. Uh, I'm managing partner of McDonald Morrissey and Associates. We're located in Concord, New Hampshire. 
Uh, we're a company that's existed since 1980 uh, when Dan Morrissey and the aforementioned Mike McDonald started the company. Mike uh, had formerly been with, actually they've both been with the US Geological Survey beforehand. Uh, Mike had been co-author along with Arlen Harbaugh of the Moklo Modeling Code. You can see that, or you can imagine that that affiliation led to a certain focus in the business, um, which was primarily teaching Moklo to consultants and scientists and uh, working on projects involving uh, groundwater modeling and, and mock loads uh, very specifically. So uh, that's really where the company is today. We continue to work on models. We develop them. We review them routinely. We work all over the country for all sorts of clients. We work for private ind industrial clients. We work for state government. We work on large litigation projects, um, always involving a model in some way, shape, or form. Um, personally, uh, I have significant technical training in, in mod flow, as you can imagine, mentored by Mike McDonald. I hold three degrees, a, a BS in hydrology from UNH, uh, a master's of science in environmental, uh, excuse me, environmental engineering from Virginia Tech and a civil engineering PhD from Virginia Tech. All of my studies uh, focused on modeling uh, throughout uh, graduate school uh, and beyond. Um, so I have about uh, approaching 20 years of professional experience in this area. Uh, uh, again, focused on groundwater flow and solute transport modeling. Uh, I've instructed on these topics uh, at the undergraduate, graduate university levels and for a variety of state agencies. So I think it's very fair to style me as an expert. Uh, as it was phrased before, I do believe I am a very qualified expert. I hope the board recognizes that expertise um, in this area. And really to cut to the chase, to, to perform a, a meaningful review of the work that's been done, we absolutely need the electronic modeling files. That means the, the input files to the model and the output files. Uh, this is a very easy thing to do. We're, we're very familiar with the, the pre-processing software that Dr. Rosine mentioned before. Groundwater Vistas is something I'm, I'm looking at on my desktop right now. So you can send us those files. It would take a matter of moments and we'd be able to open them and review them. Uh, and I'll also say it's a very common thing to do in our, our practice. Uh, it's routine for us to provide uh, the electronic files to interested parties for review. It's uh, it's expected uh, in order to to basically prove out what we are saying in a report. Our right? report is words, and in order to to verify that the values that are being reported are indeed being produced by the model, you need to look at the model. So um, I'm, I'm respectfully requesting that those files be sent uh, so we can we can dig into them and understand the specifications that are leading to the predictions. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say certainly no offense to Dr. Rosina, certainly a, a qualified scientist, but mistakes are, are common in, in mod flow models. He acknowledged that mod flow models are, uh, I think the direct quotes were uh, extreme, let's see, uh, I'm missing it here. Uh, very sophisticated, far more complicated. You know, he, he acknowledged that this is uh, not an easy thing to do, and, and I would agree with that. So, uh, you know, again, to, to provide a meaningful review and to support an assessment of does this design work and does it work without impacts to offsite properties, natural resources, we absolutely need the files. So, uh, to the board, I, again, I would, I would respectfully request that, uh, that those files be asked for and delivered to us so we can complete our review. That's all I've got. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, just speaking for myself and not the other board members, I don't really think we're in a position to uh, require that those that information be uh, delivered. Uh, I, I understand your position that it would be very helpful and valuable. Uh, I'm going to leave that to the applicant to uh, to make a decision on that uh, um, between now and the next uh, public hearing day. Um, and I'm not going to put this to we could put anyone on the spot tonight with respect to that request, so they can they can think about that and evaluate it and, and respond to it in due course. Um, I, I think as board members, our, our goal here is to ensure uh, that we have all of the best available information to assist us in determining uh, the uh, impacts of this project on, on neighbors. Um, uh, we all know that this is a challenging location. We all know that water is a problem throughout Milton. Uh, and, and this is certainly uh, no different. Um, it's a very significant project. Um, huge amount of fill being brought to the project. 
Um, it's, it's complicated uh, to some extent, it's beyond our ken, uh, and we have to rely on experts to assist us in trying to reach uh, the, the, the best and the fairest decision that we can. So all the information that's made available is, I think, better for all of us. But again, I'm going to leave it to Mr. Schomer and his team to decide how they want to um, and deal with and respond to that request for information. So my understanding is, is that we're going to not hold a public hearing next Tuesday, but rather we're going to come back two weeks from tonight, uh, whatever that date is. Um, the 8th. And now, I'm sorry? The 8th, I believe. February 8th. Mm -hmm. So that will be the next date for the public hearing, uh, at which time we'll hear from um, uh, Mr. Corcoran's um, experts that he will present to uh, to address some of these um, water issues that we we spent some time on this evening. So uh, I look forward to having this uh, additional information, and uh, look forward to hearing you on the eighth. And and again, uh, Mr. Corcoran, the sooner that uh, you get written materials to us, the better, so that we have a chance to digest and and hopefully be in a position to ask. Uh, at least semi-intelligent questions when we hear on February 8th. Uh, so thanks to all for your participation. I think it's been an interesting uh, evening and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you all again on February 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great night. Thank you. <laughs>